Hey, welcome to another Flood Court Media Whatever Wednesday. I'm Jason, and Whatever Wednesday is where we talk about something other than content creator focused videos. And today, we are looking at the RAV Power File Hub Travel Router. Now, this is a battery powered router that lets you do quite a number of things. It lets you do a one touch backup solution from an SD card to a USB drive. It lets you plug in an Ethernet cable and create a Wi Fi network. It acts as a wireless bridge mode, bridging one wireless network and then creating its own access point, but speaking wirelessly to another network. It has media sharing capabilities and it can act as a battery in an emergency. Now I've used one of these devices before. It was the D-Link DIR510L. And I use this quite a bit. It has kind of the same features, uh, battery powered, USB ports, all that stuff. But the charging cable on this has gone kaput. So I can't actually get to charge anymore. Hence why I've looked at this device. It's similar also to these Western Digital My Passport Wireless Pros where I can plug an SD card in and they'll back it up to the hard disk in here. Now this is the spinning hard disk one, not the SSD one. So it is susceptible to bangs and all of that while it's running. This is actually a very similar device to this, but it does not have an ethernet port and it's not really designed to share wireless out. It's more designed to have several devices access the files on it has can actually run as a Plex media server. But this kind of um, does that plus more. It's a simple device. It allows multiple people to connect to the internet at the same time and access files if you want to do that, plus the one backup solution. And you can back up to any kind of a device you want. You can be a SSD or a USB drive. So you're not relying on a hard drive that's difficult to travel with. This is the new version that has a USB-C port, whereas the older version had a micro USB cable. And the only reason that they changed it is because you can charge faster via USB-C. They specifically put USB-C in there to allow the faster charging. In the box, you're going to get a warranty card, as well as the instruction manual. And then you're going to get the device itself. And way in the bottom here, you get a USB-C to A, I believe it's just a charging cable. I don't think it carries data. If it does, it's only a uh, USB 2 speed. You can tell by the end of the tip there, it's white. Now I'm going to try to go over all the features on this as quick as possible because I'm leaving on vacation in nine hours and I have to record this and edit it and finish packing. And if I don't get some sleep before a seven hour drive, my wife is probably not going to be very happy. So let's dive right in. But first off to turn it on, uh, if you hold it for two seconds, the power button on the left here, you're going to get a solid power light. Now this only means that it's in battery mode. And that means that we can now charge a device. So you can see here we have a USB A, a USB C and an ethernet port. So if I bring my pixel four over, see down here, that's charging, not fast charging. Like I said, it's only one amp. And if you're curious, if you can charge from that USB C port, nope. <laughs> It's actually, see this is flashing. My phone is actually charging this. Charging connected device via USB-C. So yes, this USB-C port is only for charging. It's not for data. It's not for charging out. So two seconds gets you into battery charging mode. Holding it for the power button for five seconds is going to turn the device fully on. You're going to see this Wi-Fi indicator. Now let's go over these icons really fast. This earth obviously means when you're connected to internet, this Wi-Fi signal is for 2.4 gigahertz. This 5G, no, this does not have LTE or mobile data capabilities. They're cheating. They're calling five gigahertz, 5G. They do it all over the manual, but they specify that it's five gigahertz. So just like any router, modern router, you have 2.4 gigahertz and five gigahertz. They just throw the 5G on there for marketing purposes to try to get you to buy it. And then this last one is this SD card. And so that's when you're going to be copying via SD that's going to turn on. And then the battery indicator light. 
This does have a 6700 milliamp hour battery and the 2.4 gigahertz runs at 300 megabits per second and the 5 gigahertz runs at 433 megabits per second. So you can set the device up using a computer and an app for iOS or Android. I have my iPad here, so we'll just download this RAV file hub. So now it's gonna be searching for the Wi-Fi hotspot. It says device not connected, connect phone to device Wi-Fi. So we need to come and open up the Wi-Fi and it's this RAV file hub 2G and then some random number. And the default password for this is one, 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 one. One, 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 one. Okay, we've connected. So now we're connected to this, but you see we still don't have internet because we haven't connected this to anything. Now I could turn this into just a regular wireless router by plugging a cable into the ethernet port. It's not as common as it used to be because almost every place now in the US offers Wi-Fi. However, some places still don't. So in a hotel, you might be able to plug in a wired connection and get faster internet rather than using the hotel's Wi-Fi. Or I've used one of, I've used this older one at work when I needed to create my own hotspot for testing and didn't want to use the works network because I was afraid I was going to be cross talking across things. So I was able to just plug into a, a ethernet port and then create my own local network for testing. But the primary way you're going to connect this to the internet is in bridge mode. And that's where this is going to connect to a wireless network itself. And then your other devices will talk to this and it will relay between them almost like a repeater, but it'll be sharing out its own IP addresses and own security. Reasons you might want to do that is to keep yourself off of public networks. So like you go to a coffee shop or something like that, you don't want your devices exposed directly on that network. And so you can actually connect them to this, it's behind its own firewall, and then connect it to the rest of the open network. It's also neat because you are creating your own network. And so you can have multiple devices connected to this and have them talk wirelessly together. So you might have your iPad and your MacBook Pro and you want to share files between them wirelessly. Well, you can do it with this without having to be on the public network. One thing I always like to look at is the difference between the iOS version and the Android version. They look fairly similar to me. You can see it chose to go with dashes instead of zero. And you notice that there's one more icon on the iOS version compared to the Android version. And that difference is this camera button, which we'll get into later. But now we need to connect this to the internet. So to do that, we can click this. It's telling me a message right here I need to connect. So we'll do connect to. And it's going to go searching for my Wi-Fi network. Now I'm already noticing some differences between this and the old D-Link one that I love so much. And the first one is that this RAV power can only talk to my wireless router on the 2.4 gigahertz signal, whereas this one could connect to a 5 gigahertz signal as the bridge mode. So this is going to allow me to connect to my home Wi-Fi on 2.4 and have my devices talk to it on 2.4, but it can also turn on the 5 gigahertz signal and have the devices talk via five gigahertz to this, but then again, it drops back down to 2.4 going to my router. So this had a little bit more functionality in bridge mode, but they don't sell this anymore, which is why I went with something new. So I got this message that popped up and then you can see I'm connected to the internet, but now it's asking me to please connect to the Wi-Fi again. It says I'm still connected, so. Not quite sure what that message was about, but this says I'm connected, this says I'm connected, so I should be good to go. So before I turn on the five gigahertz signal, I wanna do a speed test on the 2.4 gigahertz. Now it specifies in the instructions, plus it's just common sense, it's gonna be slower in bridge mode. So this is gonna be talking to this, and then this has to talk to my Wi-Fi router. So you're adding in a whole step of lag in between. If we were to plug a cable directly into this and turn this into a wireless router, it would be, you know, 45 to 50% faster because there won't be that middleman of Wi-Fi in between. So when you turn the RAV power back on, it's gonna blink for a little bit as it powers on, and then if it finds a network that it knows the password to, it'll connect and then it automatically connected to the internet again. Once this turned on and connected to the network again, I went back to the app and this is still connected to the, my local network. It did not automatically connect to this. However, because it's on the same network, it's able to access it. So I can control the settings despite not being directly connected to this. 
In order to connect to five gigahertz, first we need to turn it on and we do that by pushing this 2.4 to 5G button right here for three seconds. And doing that is going to toggle. So one push is going to go from 2.4 gigahertz to 5G and then another push of three seconds. Well, we'll give it a second to blink. So when it's blinking, it's trying to connect to things. Once it goes solid, then it's done whatever it's going to do. Okay, and one more press after that is going to switch to 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz mode at the same time. Now this is going to take a while, but it will eventually reconnect to the internet now that I've turned 2.4 gigahertz back on. So about one minute later, it's finally reconnected to the internet. So now I can come and on my iPad, connect to that five gigahertz signal. You can see the 2G, what they call 2.4 gigahertz and the five gigahertz. And that password is also eight ones. Now we're connected to the five gigahertz. So this is five gigahertz to this, and then this is 2.4 gigahertz to my router. So here are the average speed results that I got using my Galaxy Note 20 Ultra and the RAV File Hub. Uh, talking to my AC router. So I ran each test five times and averaged out the speeds and I performed the tests in two different rooms. Uh, one was in the same room as my router and the other was two rooms away so I had a couple walls in between. And now obviously the modem that's in the Galaxy Note 20 Ultra is going to be way better than the 300 megabits or 433 megabits per second that's in the RAV file hub. So that's way off to the side but I just wanted to show what it would look like if you did not use this in between. The direct router, like I said, that's phone to my wireless router. The wired mode is using the RAV file hub as the router itself. So I've plugged in an ethernet cable and then the Wi-Fi mode is gonna be using it in bridge mode. So that's gonna be going from my phone to the file hub to my wireless router and back and forth. Uh, something interesting is in the same room uh, on Wi-Fi mode, I was actually on 5.8 gigahertz, actually able to be pretty close to the wired mode, but the moment you start moving further and further away, uh, wired mode is still gonna be faster. Um, the 2.4 gigahertz speeds are pretty disappointing, but that's to be expected. You're gonna get better signal attenuation. If I had went maybe a couple more rooms away, I might not even get the five gigahertz signal to show up at all. But make of these speed tests what you will, just that's what you might expect to get in these locations. One other thing I've noticed between this and my old one is the fact that my old one had a guest network. And that was something that was really great because I could just set this up in my house, connect it to my network, and whenever I had a party or something, they could connect to this one. I could just put no password on it at all. And that way they had internet in my house and then when all of my guests left, I could just turn it off. This one does not have that. Now you can go in and change the password on any of these and set it up to act like a guest network, but this had its own dedicated password protected ones and then a guest network as well. Before we take a look at the other settings in the app though, let's take a look at the backup functions. I need to get some media on here so that we can look at how the media streaming or even Chromecasting works. Now I would tell you how long this will run on its internal battery, but to be honest, I can't find that documentation anywhere, not on the manual, not on the website, not in Amazon's frequently asked questions. So if I find out, I'll leave that in the video description down below. This does support up to two terabyte SD cards, the SDXC, and on hard drives, it supports up to three terabytes. Now, if you're using one like a spinning mechanical disc that requires a lot of power, you're gonna to have to plug it into an external power source because the one amp on this is not gonna be enough to power a full spinning hard drive but these SDs are no problem for it. In terms of file support, it supports FAT32, XFAT, and NTFS. So now let's talk about backing up an SD card. So when I plug in an SD card here on the right side, you're gonna see this SD icon light up. Maybe. And it's going to blink a little bit and you saw it was device detected. Anytime those are flashing, it just means it's thinking you need to wait. So you can see on the app that, yep, it's a 120 gigabyte SD card and that's what's available. Now that it's in there, using the app, we can go and browse through there. So this was just an SD card from my Fuji X-T3, so that's what the DCIM file is. But when you plug in 
any SD card or USB drive, it's going to create this share folder. Now the share folder is what these app icons can read from. If it's not in the share folder, you can't access it via a quick shortcut here. You'd have to come to file management and browse for it manually. Let's go ahead and plug in the USB drive now. No indicator light turns on for that, but you can see these are flashing because again, it's thinking. If I were to take the SD card out, this would turn off even if I had this plugged in. Saw so a device was detected. And now you can see the two dots underneath the word file management. And that means that we can look at the different devices we have plugged in. So this is a terabyte SSD and there's that SD card. One nice thing about this is you do not need the app or the internet or the network at all in order to back up from your SD card onto a USB drive. Reasons you might want to do this is if you're out and want to make a backup copy, so you've taken you know an hour's worth of pictures, you can plug in a USB drive, your SD card, copy it on here, then you need to have two copies, or your SD card is filling up, so you can just dump it on there, or you want to edit off of this and not off your SD card, so you can just dump everything on here and then go edit on your iPad, plugged into your you know faster SSD. Let's look at what we're going to be backing up. So let's browse this SD card. When you go to file management, it doesn't matter which you're on, you're going to be able to select from both of them in here. So the SD card and the USB drive. So let's go into the SD card and you can see I just have a handful of photos here. You can just click this SD card backup assuming you have the app running. But let's pretend we don't have the app running and put this off to the side. In order to back up just using this, Make sure nothing is flashing, that way everything's been processed and is ready to go. And you just hold this SD to USB button right here for five seconds. So while it's copying, that SD icon is gonna flash, and when it turns solid again, it's done copying. This is still backing up. I opened up the app just to see if it was showing any indication that the backup was going on. You can see this SD card is spinning, showing that the backup is still progressing. So the SD card stopped blinking, so that means the copy should be done. So now if I come to file management and this USB disk drive, I should see this new folder called SD backup and it's put it in there by date. And then it's just started copying in everything that was on there. Whoop, everything that's on the SD card. It did not copy in the shared folder, which is a little odd, but anyway, there's all of the uh, pictures. Now this does feature pretty good file management, which is excellent because file management on iPads, while it's gotten better with iPad OS, iOS devices in general stink at file management. So it's nice to be able to just come in here and manually do some things. So you can see at the bottom, you are seeing the RAV file hub. So you're looking at the stuff on here, but you can also jump over to the iPad and see uh, the iPad photos. And it looks like it has access to the documents. On Android, I was able to see pretty much all of the file system on Android, just like you would with any file browser on Android. But if I come in here and want to copy like this, so I can long press it, select it, you have the option to copy to, delete, share. That's just going to give you your general sharing options or more, you can rename it. But for copy to, I can't, well, I can copy it to my iPad storage, or I can click up here to the external storage. And now I can copy it to the SD card manually if I want or I can copy it to another folder on my USB drive. So I'm gonna copy it to that shared folder, which I already stuck something in there for a test. If I can paste it there, and now in here that share, you can see that picture that I just copied. Now that I put a couple files in the share folder, we can come and look at those apps. So video, it's gonna show you all the videos in those share folders. You can also view your iPad videos down here as well. It's gonna ask for permission. Let's go back to that RAV power. So I just have one here. It's a 4K video, but I think it's only playing at 50 megabits per second. So I had started watching it and pause. It's asking me if I want to start playing it from the beginning again or start from where I was. So you can see that plays just fine. And then you have something called DLNA. And this is the ability to share to another device. So I've connected a Chromecast to this, which we'll look at here in a second. 
casting from here over to a TV. If we come to photos, you're going to see that one photo that I'd copied in there. I did not copy any music in, but I think you can assume what music is going to be like. Now, photo backup, you can actually back up files from here onto one of your devices. Looks like you can also back up contacts. And this last icon, as I said, is not available on Android. It's only on iOS. And if we click it, it's going to ask to access the camera. That's what's above me, <laughs> my microphone. But basically, if I take a picture now using the app, it's going to automatically save it on the USB drive. It's not going to save it on the iPad. And so as long as you're within 10 meters or I think 38 feet of this, now that's best case scenario, so I probably wouldn't go further than five meters or you know 15 feet away from it. But as long as you're close enough in range to this, it'll back up everything directly to this and not save it on your, your iPhone or your iPad. That way you can save space on here. So if you want to just go take pictures of all your family members at a reunion, then you could, you know, snap, 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 and it just all go right on here, and you won't waste any space on your actual device. And then it created another folder in the USB drive called camera, photo and video. I didn't take any video, but there's that image I took of the ceiling. Now I've gone and given this an admin password, which is a good thing to do, and now it gives me the option to log in as a guest or not. So. I can log in as an admin or I can log in as a guest. Now, if I do guest, I only have access to some of the options. I don't have the save my camera and say backup contacts and stuff like that. I can still run the SD card backup, which is a little strange. But So then when you're logged in as guest, you can see it doesn't show how much hard drive space is available or anything like that. And if I go to file management and click on this, it's only showing what's in that share folder. So it's a great way to you know, limit what your kids can get at. So you could dump this full of movies and TV shows that the kids can watch and log them in as guests, and they can't really mess anything up except for what's in that share folder. They can't get into actual backups or anything like that and you know, lose important data. And then if you want to just come back here and log out, you can log in as admin again. So now I'm logged in as admin again, and you see I have all of my features. And to give yourself an admin password, you just come to System Settings, User Settings, and there you can put in the admin password. You can also set up the host name, which is what's going to show up if you're browsing probably from Windows or something like that. And then you have disk information, which is going to give you just a graphical representation of what your disks look like. You can also disable that guest user so only the admin can get in. This here gives you the option to clear backup records. So it keeps track of what's already been backed up so it doesn't back it up again. But if you want to just start all over, you can come here and click clear backup record and it'll start backing up everything, assuming nothing has ever been backed up. And cache, as you play movies or look at pictures, it's going to cache some of it to your device. And you can come in here and clear it out if it's taking up too much space. One final thing is I want to look at a more difficult video to play. So I am on the five gigahertz band, which it says is necessary to play 4K videos. So I'm not going to try and push it on the two gigahertz band. I'm going to take its advice and believe that I need to be on the five gigahertz band. So I'm gonna play this video, Ronin SC balancing, and it is a 100 megabit per second 4K, whereas the other one was about 50 megabits per second. So you can see it hey, takes longer. Hey, welcome to another Flirtcourt Media tech tutorial thing. And now you can see it stuttering trying to play this because like I said, it's 100 megabits per second compared to 50 megabits per second for the other one. So even on the 5G signal, it can't play this cleanly. And my phone wasn't able to play it cleanly either. So that's just something to keep in mind. If you're copying movies that you have and using Handbrake to transcode them, you need to transcode them to a slightly lower quality so that way you can actually play them over the 5G. Now, in order to get this choppy video to play, I would need to copy it from here to the iPad to get it to play. With the Android app, I don't see it on the iPad app. You can't actually tell it to open with a different media player. So if you had VLC or something like that, that might play it better, but I wouldn't hold my breath. So just make sure if you are transcoding videos specifically for this, keep the bit rate down because if you know several different people, two different kids are watching on their own devices in the van, that's gonna be splitting 
the signal between two different things. So the lower the bit rate, the better the playback experience is gonna be. There is no eject button on here, so if you wanna take something out, you just make sure nothing's flashing and just take it out and the app will register that something's been removed. And one thing that this doesn't have that's kind of a bummer that my old one did have is there is no user modifiable firewall. You cannot go in here and block ports or anything like that. It's more of just a pass through everything. However, it puts everything on its own subnet, its own IP address system. So you do have the ability to talk from this to this privately because if a person does not have the Wi-Fi password to get on here, even if you're a coffee shop and you're using this as a bridge, they won't be able to see what you're doing inside of this. So it's, it's protected via the SSID password, but that's it, all the ports are open. The documentation didn't say what kind of file types this app supported, but in my testing, it did work fine with H.264 and H.265 files. But if you have something other than that, that's where again, with the Android at least, you have the ability to play with a third party player that may be able to handle some other format. The last thing I have to talk about is the DLNA or casting features, if you will. So I have a Chromecast plugged into this TV here and it's connected to the Wi-Fi network of the RAV Power. And I'll show you how it's supposed to work, but I have yet to actually get it to work. So you come here and you select a video and it's gonna start playing. So we'll pause that. And you probably can't see it, but the bottom right is a DLNA icon. DLNA icon. Disappears really fast. So you tap that, and it's gonna give you a list of DLNA compatible devices, so Chromecasts, Roku's. And if you hit, you tap the one that you want it to play to, and then you click X. And supposedly right now, it should be trying to connect to that Chromecast and playing, but as you can see, absolutely nothing is happening. And from what I've seen reading on the internet, this is pretty much the expected behavior. Tapping this icon up here again just lets me come back and try to select it again. Uh, nothing really seems to get this to work. I tried on my Android phone as well, and there the list of devices, the Chromecast doesn't even show up at all. However, this is one thing where the Android gets a point in its favor. As I explained earlier, with the iOS, you get the ability to copy photos directly from the iPad to this as you take them. But the Android app, because you have the ability to play third-party videos, this supposedly also supports third-party videos. If I long press on it and then hit more, I have the ability to play via third-party application but tapping that just says no installed application to play file. But with the Android app, if I come to video, long press it, and select more, I have use third party player. If I select that, then I can you know, choose photos or Plex or VLC. I'm just gonna choose photos just once. So it's playing in the photos app but now I have the Chromecast icon up here. So if I click that and select Travel TV, now the Photos app is telling it to cast. So now casting works just fine using the Android phone because I use that third-party app. Whereas the DNLA doesn't work at all. I've gone ahead and got my laptop out so we can see what the interface looks like on the web browser. So to get to the default, it's 101010.254. And because I've added the password already, I need to enter that. So it kind of gives you the same options. You can look at videos, photos, documents, and file browser. And playing videos works just as you'd expect. See what that explorer looks like. So you can just come in and browse through the folders of your SSD. Where the difference comes in is gonna be the settings. So if we click on that, you can see some information about the device. Uh, you can see what kind of CPU percentage is being used. It seems awfully high for not actually playing videos right now. It's just sitting there serving the internet, but okay. And um, you can come in here and see your storage. Now, 
here in the web browser offers this delete and I'm not quite sure if I click on it, it says kind of in bad English. Are you sure you want to remove the USB disc one? The way that reads is it seems like, do you want to eject it? But I'm pretty sure if I click OK, it's going to format it. So that's kind of bad wording that could lead to potential damage. So that's what's under information under user. You have the ability to change the admin password again. Or you can put a password on the guest, which was not available on the app. Under network, there's going to be quite a bit more functionality. Host name again, that's probably, I believe, what shows up if you're browsing via Samba network. Wi Fi and LAN. So this is what is going to be for the 2.4 gigahertz as well as the access point. So what I mean by that is you can come in here and change the password of the 2.4 gigahertz band, but you can also come in and change the gateway address. So this is the default and you can see that's what I'm logged into up here. And so you can change that. So you, know, you might change it to 192.168.1.1 to be more standard. You can also change the security information. And then under Wi-Fi and 5G, pretty much you just get to change the password. You can also change the mode, but come in and change the password. This does obviously have the ability to do a DHCP server, which is how all these devices are getting an IP address from the Wi-Fi access point, but it's pretty basic. Um, all you can come in here is just basically put the start address and end address and change your DNS. So if you wanted to use, you know, Cloudflare's public one, the faster one, or Google's, you know, 8.8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8 .8. That's pretty much about all you can do that's worthwhile. Client list, you can't see what's connected, so that's kind of handy. It'd be nice if that was on the app. But really, there's no port forwarding, there's no customization. It's pretty basic. And then internet, uh, I'm only on wireless access right now. Uh, we'll take a look at wired access here once I get plugged in. And uh, you can turn off DHCP if you need to. Scan, you're just going to scan for the different SSIDs to connect to. Under services, then you can turn off Samba, which is the Win file services, Windows file services. DLNA service, which doesn't work very well. It's probably better just to turn it off. That way you're not wasting CPU cycles, assuming all of the other file browsing works, which I think it would. And then access permission via the WAN port. So that's if you actually plug something into the Ethernet jack, you can require permission in order to use that, apparently. <laughs> Under system, you can update the time, which, I mean, I guess technically that's right, but I've never selected Bocata. Uh, usually it's Chicago time or Central time. Everything else looks like it updated fine. Firmware upgrade, so you can go on the website and look for a new firmware and upgrade it here, and then obviously reset everything back to normal. And wizard, it looks like it's just going to help you connect to the internet. So conclusion time, what do I think about this? Well, to be honest, I like my older D-Link one better, but they don't sell this anymore. As far as what's available now, I'm pretty happy with this one. It gives the awesome option of being able to back up. So I do always usually carry some of these around uh, to back stuff up onto. And it'd be nice not to have to pull out a laptop or copy to my phone and then copy to this just to have it all in one spot or, you know, lug around this big spinning hard drive that has the potential of being damaged if I hit it too hard. Wish the wireless speeds were faster, but it is what it is. I was a little disappointed in the 4K playback. However, I knew that that video file that I tested that was choppy as one that I upload to YouTube. It's a mastered copy. So it's a very high bit rate. Most times you're not going to be playing something at that high of a bit rate. I do wish the casting features worked better. I wish they'd just implement in a Chromecast button and the protocols that go along with that instead of using the DLNA because DLNA as it's currently implemented doesn't work at all. Again, you can get around it using the Android, but not on iOS. I'm also disappointed that the bridge mode is limited to 2.4 gigahertz and there's no guest SSID. However, the nice things about this is the file management is excellent. I was able to navigate around all the different files on Android and iOS and copy things went very smoothly. I never saw any problems with it. And 
It gave me functionality on iOS that you normally don't get see. In the end, this device is definitely focused more towards someone who cares about file management rather than network management. The network management aspects of this are non-existent. You get to change the SSID, hide it, and that's about it. There's no port forwarding, there's no subnet masking, there's no IP specifying. File management on this is very good. You get to navigate all the folder structures easily, copying worked well. Backing up is a little slow, but it got the job done. All in a nice compact device that gives you the option to suck power from this onto a phone on the go. In the end, this device is really inexpensive and it does a great job at what it set out to do, offering lots of file management. If you're looking for more network management, then maybe look into one of the other options. But that's gonna do it for this episode. If you wanna pick up one for yourself and help support my channel, I have an affiliate link in the video description down below. And if you use it, it doesn't cost you a single penny more. I just get a little kickback for you using my link. And if you like this video and want to help others find it, give it a thumbs up. That way, when they're looking for this type of thing, my video pops up. And if you want to see more Whatever Wednesdays or content creator stuff on Fridays or maybe Saturdays if I'm late, then go ahead and subscribe and you get notified when those come out. But until next time, I'm doing what I love. Keep doing what you love. Thanks for watching. One last complaint is I can hear it. It's, I can hear the coils whining and clicking in there. I could hear it when I was just sitting here on the table and I was just waiting for the air conditioning to stop. I could hear it over the air conditioning. It's very high pitch, so if you don't hear high pitch noises, it'll be all right, but it's slightly annoying. <laughs>